Um, thank you all very much for joining us today and welcome to the Happy Menopause Live. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jackie Lynch. I am a registered nutritional therapist um, and I'm your host for tonight. So a little bit about me first. Uh, my Well, Well, Well Nutrition Clinic specializes in women's health and the menopause. Um, I'm the author of The Happy Menopause. Here we are, quick plug. Smart Nutrition to Help You Flourish. And uh, I'm also the host of the Happy Menopause podcast. So um, what I wanted to do tonight really was just throw things open to some of those really burning questions around menopause, um, essentially uh, anxiety, brain fog, and just what's the best way to move generally. So before I do that, I just want to remind you all that we've got an amazing prize draw. And simply by being here tonight, um, each of you is automatically entered. So I'd like to give uh, a massive thank you to, uh, first of all, to Better You, Emma Pell and Silk for their fabulous gifts. We've got menopause friendly supplements. We've got luxurious skincare products. We've got a wonderful intimacy hamper. And uh, Dr. Sabina has also offered the audio books for Beating Brain Fog and 100 Days to a Younger Brain. And you'll also be getting copies of my own books in the prize pack. So um, really worth sticking around to make sure your name goes in the draw. We're going to be announcing the winners at the end. Um, but let's just um, welcome three of my most popular podcast guests. So if we could lose the slide and let's have um, Sabina, Christine and uh, Rachel on video. Um, can I ask everybody else who is in the panelists, please to switch off their videos at this point so we can just see the speakers. That would be great. Um, so uh, we're going to be discussing the red hot topics of brain fog with Dr. Sabina Brennan, anxiety with Rachel Weiss, and movement with Christine Bird. And what I'm planning to do is have a 10 minute chat with each of them, covering off some of the key questions around their topic. Uh, once we've done that, I'm going to throw it open to a panel discussion uh, and your questions. So please do feel free to pop them in the chat. We've already received some questions in advance from some of you on social media as well. So I'm gonna be sure to throw those in. So without further ado, um, uh, Sabina, um, over to you. Rachel, Christine, can you, and uh, Laura, could you switch off your videos along with uh, Yvonne Canny um, and Philomena, if you could switch off your videos, that'd be great. Um, wonderful, thank you. Okay, so Laura, I don't know if it's possible to highlight um, uh, Sabina and I so that they, we are um, the main deal on the screen. I think it also depends on how you have your view. So if you pick up um, speaker view, then you'll be able to see uh, Christine, uh, sorry, Sabina and I. So let me introduce Dr. Sabina Brennan. She is a chartered healthy psychologist. She's a neuroscientist. And she's also the host of the fantastic Superbrain podcast. Um, her latest book, which I'm just going to wave here, her latest book, Beating Brain Fog, um, is something I discussed with her. <laughs> oh, snap. Um, in the, Happy Menopause, the Happy Menopause podcast interview. Uh, with, and it's a wonderful read. There's lots of practical strategies to support and tune up your brain. And it will really help you combat issues around uh, poor memory, um, loss of concentration. So let's hear what she's got to say. Uh, if we can lose the slide, let's just get me and Sabina up on the screen because I've got questions for her. So Sabina, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's and hello pleasure. to everyone from all over the world. <laughs> I know, I know. It's Slowly. truly international, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So um, my first question to you is this. Uh, what is brain fog? Well, brain fog is a general term. It's like an umbrella term that describes a collection of symptoms. Now, the most common of those symptoms are a loss of mental clarity, an inability to focus or to concentrate, problems with learning and with remembering, uh, a slowing of your thinking, and also issues with language um, such as word finding or even just finding that your language, your speech isn't as rich or as fluid as it ordinarily would be, a mental fatigue as, a, as opposed to a physical fatigue, 
and um, also trouble navigating spaces, what you, most people would refer to as clumsiness. So if you've ever had brain fog, the following, you know, would probably be very familiar. You know, oh my God, I just can't think straight. I can't concentrate. My brain just feels so sluggish. I, I you know, I have trouble recalling what I did yesterday. Uh, I'm struggling to find the right word. I know certainly for me, I, you know, for a few years, my life was like a constant game of charades. Um, and I feel too tired to think you know I think that fatigue um, is really a mental fatigue it's absolutely exhausting your brain just can't do anymore or I keep bumping into things so the thing to point out is that we've all experienced some of those things and probably all of them at certain points in our life but usually there's a direct explanation like um, uh, you know jet lag or you've been burning the candle at both ends or you've been up too long but the difference with brain fog is that those symptoms occur regularly and um, they're persistent and they interfere interfere with your ability to carry out uh, your work and they can interfere with your relationships and the quality of your life. So that's where it gets into the brain fog. Um, mm. so. And I think a lot of what you've mentioned sounds really familiar. I think certainly as we move into perimenopause and menopause, that sense of grappling with just searching for a word, you know the word, and it's yeah. simply not there. And it's quite interesting because I think people wouldn't necessarily associate that with brain fog. They think of it as sort of poor memory and loss of concentration, but it's much broader, clearly. Yes, it's broader. And, and you know, the thing is, it also does affect, you, you know, your frontal lobes, and, and that can mean you have problems with making decisions and solving problems. And that really can impact on uh, your day-to-day -day living. And when I'm talking about making decisions, I'm not even talking about the big decisions. I'm talking about opening the fridge and not being able to decide decide what you should cook for dinner or the wardrobe and decide what you should um what you should wear um but as you said uh, you know that's quite a com brain fog is quite a common symptom of uh menopause um and if we were to talk about the symptoms and causes of brain fog there are many and they are multiple and for many people going through perimenopause they may actually have multiple factors that are contributing to their main pause uh, to their brain fog and in a way that is sort of a, a part of the solution because even if it's hormonal imbalance or um you know something that you might you, you might take some time to address you can address some of the other factors and then your brain fog may be minimized and some of those other fa factors are underlying health conditions so very common and and most of those underlying health conditions disproportionately affect women so you're talking things like autoimmune diseases inflammatory diseases chronic pain um depression, anxiety, type two diabetes, and even some cancers. Um, brain fog can also be the side effect of a medication. Unfortunately, it is often the side effect of a medication that is used to treat those very uh, disorders that can give rise to brain fog. Essentially, any medication that operates on your central nervous system has the capacity to produce brain fog um, symptoms and a lot of those are, 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 are medications that we take regularly and frequently so things like painkillers and um, things like antihistamines anti-nausea tablets um, and you know um, tab tablets for anxiety and depression now the thing is if you're on a prescribed medication it's, and you suspect that's at the root of your brain fo fog it's very important to speak to your prescribing doctor and um, look for alternatives because there may be an alternative that you can take. Never stop taking medication that you've been prescribed without um, consulting. Uh, mm -hmm. As I mentioned, the result of hormonal changes and not just a perimenopause and many menopause, but also um, PMT uh, during pregnancy, uh, postnatal, um, uh, they're all times that are free. And, and you've heard terms like baby brain, you know, pregnancy brain. Certainly I only, you know, in hindsight now, no. I mean, I used to become clumsy just before my period I knew that I yeah. was getting my period if I started to bump, to bump into things um, and also if I wanted to row with people that was always a good <laughs> signal for me I became very irritable and I literally would need feel like I needed a bloodletting you know like in terms of it's like I had to have an argument with something um, nutritional deficiencies you'll be very familiar with these um, uh, Jackie um, so nutritional or dietary deficiency primarily a vitamin B12 deficiency iron deficiency mm -hmm. a folate deficiency or an omega-3 deficiency can give rise to symptoms. And then the other lifestyle factors, and these are frequently key in improving your prognosis with brain fog, and they are poor sleep, poorly managed chronic stress, lack of exercise and lack of mental stimulation. Um, so basically, yeah, you can see how we can do something about those things to improve our brain fog.
Yeah, I think that I think what's what's coming through loud and clear is that brain fog is is hugely broad and pretty much everyone at any stage in their life will be affected by it. But of course, you know, we women in midlife are very aware that with the hormonal connection as well, um, it's going to be potentially much more uh, of an issue. And what I'm hearing is that you also need to just look at the extraneous factors that might be there because while it may or may not be due to your hormones if there's other things going on if you are deeply stressed if you're not sleeping which of course really common during the menopause then that's going to make everything worse isn't it yeah no absolutely um and actually one of the main reasons i wrote the book is that i felt that people women you know in perimenopause and menopause um you know when they notice these issues they start to catastrophize and think maybe they're starting to get dementia and it's very important to draw that distinction that brain fog and dementia are entirely different brain fog is reversible and there really are an awful lot of things that you can do to do that as you said unfortunately with the menopause things like hot flashes and you know disrupted sleep are going to kind of uh, make it more difficult and also at that point in our lives you know we're often you know that sandwich generation where we're looking after elderly perhaps unwell parents and still working to try and put children through school or university so we have a lot of chronic stress excuse me I'm going to sneeze I think (laughs) it's Um, true yes midlife is a a hugely stressful time for women I think you're absolutely right I should say though you can come out the other side and it's really great (laughs) so that's that's going to be my next question really because you've you've set the stage really clearly but you know what what do we do about it are there things that we can do in a concrete fashion that can manage and, and relieve our brain fog Yeah, absolutely. And I do in the book, actually, what I let you do is because I feel an awful lot of women are not heard when they go to their doctors and it might be written off as, oh, you're just very stressed. And that could be true. But you need to get to know and understand the specifics of your brain fog because different parts of your brain are affected differently. And so in the book, you can take questionnaires and you can actually then put together something where you can go to your doctor with something concrete and say, well, actually, I experiencing problems with, um, you know, my language and it seems to occur, you know, more frequently when X, Y, Z and and persist that it be taken seriously because it is quite debilitating. It's important to rule out any of those underlying conditions if you have them or suspect medications. But then really after that, it is about prioritizing sleep. Um, It is about managing um, stress and we can manage stress. There's nothing wrong with stress. It's when we don't manage it properly that it becomes problematic. Um, A balanced brain healthy diet um, and um, exercise, physical exercise is really, really important. It will help you sleep better as well. It will boost your mood and then mental stimulation your brain actually thrives on challenge it needs to be challenged you need to be pushed beyond your comfort zone and when you do that your brain actually becomes fitter and sharper just as if you go to the gym and you start a workout you know you actually have to keep pushing yourself to the next level for your body to benefit and improve and it's the exact same with your brain so while you might feel exhausted it's important to look after your sleep but it is also important to use that brain and try to work up from whatever baseline you're at if your brain fog is quite debilitating you can still start working in very small steps to challenge yourself and to improve it and it will pay off over time that's fantastic uh, just one last thing I remember it really struck me when you said that um, when we did the podcast together is that we have no trouble as we get older in cutting ourselves a little bit of slack that we can't run as fast as we used to but somehow we beat ourselves up because you can't quite remember um, things as, as quickly but well, if you give yourself the time it will come I remember you saying something yes no absolutely so that's the slowing so when you have brain fog Uh, So brain fog is different from, you know, maybe changes that can occur with aging, you know, as we we get older, but that's slowing. It's the slowing of processing speed. So basically your brain is a data processing machine. That's what it is. It's taking information. It processes, makes sense of it and produces either a response or, you know, whatever, whether that's a motor response or physical response. So our bodies slow down in, in that way. And so the exact same thing happens. The information just takes a tiny bit longer to process. Unfortunately, we get cross with ourselves and then that releases is cortisol that interferes with finding the word for example that you're looking for whereas actually if you just relax into it and say you know we just need to be more I actually was brought around a beautiful garden yesterday in in a house that we're buying by the owner who's in his 80s and I asked him to show me all the names of the trees and the shrubs and he said oh I don't know if I can remember them all I said it doesn't matter let's just go they'll come and as I just said yeah let you know 
when I knew he was struggling, I'd say, oh, the leaves are beautiful, whatever. And then he'd say, oh, it's for Burnham, such and such, such and such, because I wasn't putting yeah. him under any pressure. And he yeah. remembered not just yeah. the, you know, the everyday name, he remembered the um, the Latin name. And it's there. Yeah. Trust your brain. No, it is there. there. That is, well, that's a very positive way to, to finish this. So thank you for our 10 minute whistle stop tour. We'll be coming back to you for thank the panel you. discussion. Um, so if you can uh, close down your video and let's welcome Rachel to the screen. Rachel, hi. Um, now I'd like to introduce you to Rachel Vice. She is an accredited counsellor. She's a coach and she's the co-founder of the Rowan Consultancy, which provides a range of counselling and psychotherapy services. But she's got another hat. She's also the founder of Menopause Cafe, which is a highly successful international movement and also uh, organises the, the first annual Men uh, Menopause Festival, which is lovingly known as hashtag FlushFest. Uh, now tickets for FlushFest 22 will be available soon. So you can sign up to the Menopause Cafe newsletter and we'll be sharing a link about that later. Um, but it's a totally winning combination, Rachel, of mental health and menopause expertise. So we are in excellent hands. And having had, I think, all that advice from um, Sabina just now about sort of calming down the stress and managing the stress, I think it's really uh, great that we're moving to you now to have a little chat about how we overcome anxiety. So my first question to you is, you know, why is it happening? Anxiety. It happens for a variety of reasons, Jackie. So we've evolved to be anxious people. So it's a human thing to be anxious. And then it can get worse in the menopause. We've evolved because if you and I were walking through the jungle and I'm going, hey, look at the pretty flowers, look at the blue sky. And if you, Jackie, are going, that blade of grass moved, I wonder if that's a tiger. Who is going to survive and live to fight another day? You are. So don't beat yourselves up. It's natural to be anxious. Anxiety is worrying about the future. Um, however, it's not so useful nowadays if we spend all our time being anxious. We can also get more anxious due to our our genetics or due to things, our childhood. If you grew up in a, in a dangerous environment where you were continually on edge in case somebody hit you or shouted at you or anything, just then you're gonna have a reduced window of tolerance. You're gonna just grow up more anxious looking for trouble than maybe someone who grew up in a calmer house. Or if something's happened to you in the past, trauma or adverse childhood experiences, that can make you more anxious for the rest of your life. Um, so it's just the way you are. Try not to beat yourself up about it. There are things beyond your control. We'll talk about things that are within your control to make it um, easier. So that's why we're anxious. We evolved that way. And for some of us, our genetics, our childhood experiences or our life experiences have made us permanently yeah. rich. But of course, as we move into midlife and menopause, some women find that the anxiety suddenly sort of hits them, even when they haven't necessarily been anxious in the past. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's what we find in counselling. If somebody comes with anxiety at this stage, in the, in the stage of life where they might be menopausal, it's always useful to ask, have you been anxious before? Is this new? So it could be due to the hormone changes. Remember how anxious most of us were as teenagers, which was the last time our hormones went all over the place. Life stage, um, like was mentioned earlier, if you've got aging parents, young kids, whatever, um, but also the culture we live in, that becoming menopausal is not viewed as a good thing. Becoming an older woman is not celebrated as, hey, great, respect, wisdom, no. So a lot of people can have what I'd call an existential crisis of, oh no, I'm old, I haven't had kids if they wanted to have kids, I haven't achieved my career. So there's a lot of stuff going on that's not just biological that can make people anxious at this stage. Yeah. So what would sort of what would you expect to see? I mean, how does anxiety manifest itself? I'll show you how it manifests itself. Have a look at this. This is anxiety. OK, I hope you can see that slide. Um, so what happens is our body reacts as if we're being chased by a saber toothed tiger. So what a lot of people notice in anxiety is sweating. Your heart pounding fast, the blood goes to your muscles so that you're ready to run and fight or fly, flee. The blood goes away from your digestive system, so you may have digestive problems. Um, you keep imagining in your brain disastrous scenarios about the future. You're unable to concentrate because your prefrontal lobes got disconnected because your survival mechanisms are flashing away. So your body reacts as if you're, being, you're in life-threatening danger, even though you're not. That's what you notice. Yeah, so what are we gonna do about it? 
How can we manage it? What's going on? Um, I, there are so many things you can do. That's the good news. It's not easy. OK, that's the bad news. But like learning any new habit, you can learn to manage your anxiety and learn to live with it. And this is a useful life skill and a useful one to practice, um, not just yeah. for menopause. So here are a few ways that you can help with your anxiety and learn to live with it. You can't get rid of it. It's the way you're wired. It's, but what you can do is learn to manage it and live with mm. it. So breathing. Have a go, everybody, now. Just breathe out. You're on mute, so we won't hear you. You will naturally <laughs> breathe in again, so you don't need to fuss about the breathing in. Just breathe out like you're blowing out candles. From your mouth, make a noise. And as you breathe out, see if you can relax your shoulders a bit or your jaw, or it might be your neck, you know, wherever in your body you carry your anxiety and stress. So that's a great thing you can do anywhere. Um, and it's a good idea to practice mindful breathing when you're not anxious, so that when you do need it, you can just do it immediately. So I really recommend practice breathing. So, so, um, if you Google for apps, they can help you on how to, how to be mindful and breathe in the present moment. Um, another thing that helps is grounding. So I'll give you a quick example of that. Grounding is helping yourself be present in the present moment, because anxiety is always about the future. If you think about it, we're fearful about the future. If we could realize that right now in the present moment, actually you're safe, okay? So here's one technique for helping to ground you in the present moment. Try it now, um, everyone. Just have a look around the room, wherever you are, and name to yourself five things you can see. So I can see a picture. I can see the bed, because I'm in a spare bedroom. Um, I can see my clothes. I can see the bin. I can see the radiator. I've lost count. It doesn't really matter. But when you're having a panic attack or feeling anxious, name five things you can see. Then four things you can touch. I can touch the mouse, the keyboard. I can feel my diary. I can touch the trousers on my legs. I can feel the socks on my feet. And then continue through the other things here. Name three things you can hear. I can hear my parents walking outside. I can hear my own voice. <laughs> I can hear some traffic. Two things you can smell and one thing you can taste. And if you can just take yourself through that slowly when you're panicking or feeling anxious, it helps to ground you in the present moment. And there's a whole list of other things there, Jackie, but I'm aware we haven't got much time. So I'll just flash those ones up. But yeah, medication can help. Relaxation, self-compassion. And counselling. I mean, go and see someone about it. If you had a broken leg, you wouldn't try and fix it yourself. So if you're suffering from anxiety, go and see a professional who can give you help. Yeah, I think that's absolutely fantastic advice, because the thing is, uh, to pick up on, on the issue around self-compassion, we aren't often very kind to ourselves. Yeah. Um, I think we expect a lot of ourselves and uh, probably give ourselves a good talking to and say, pull yourself together. Um, and I remember when we did the podcast together, one of the things that you said that really struck me is that when you're feeling anxious, you know, talk to yourself as you would a very dear friend. And that really struck me because, you know, you wouldn't talk to other people the way sometimes you talk to yourself, I think. No, absolutely. Um, so when you're feeling anxious, yeah, we can get really self-critical and tell, tell, maybe you've always been confident giving presentations and suddenly you're not anymore at work. Hmm. instead of cursing yourself and saying how silly you are what would you say to a good friend you would be kind you would speak lovingly to them or to a small child or to whoever so yeah that really helps yeah yeah and I think your your analysis around the saber-toothed tiger and I mean what's going on in the brain generally I think is very important because just knowing that you know it's one of those things you can't actually you know don't worry about it just be with it and, and just let it calm itself down rather than worrying about what's going on and, and being hard on yourself. It's really easy to say, Jackie. So I don't want people listening to feel bad about this anxiety. So although the, the way to deal with it is simple, like we said, breathing and talking calmly, you absolutely have to practice this. Yeah. You're probably trying to undo the habit of decades that you even learned when you were little watching people, how they reacted around you when they were anxious. So really practice. The breathing, the grounding, the talking to yourself. And it's a skill for life. I mean, yeah. it's not a bad thing that we have to learn this at this stage in our life. If you haven't learned it earlier in your life, learn it now. Um, yeah. And I can see people are saying in the chat that I think bioidenticals can help diet and ex exercise. Rhythmic movement really helps, whether it's dancing or walking yeah. from repetitive rhythmic movement. 
just helps to soothe us. Think of babies when they're upset, what do we do? We rock them or we pat them. Or, or hug yourself, I don't know if you can see on here, but try one of these gestures and see what works best for you. Or maybe it's putting your hands on your heart with a gentle pressure. Yeah. Or for some people it's rubbing your tummy. Just try a few physical things with a gentle repetitive movement and, and that helps. If you Absolutely. can't feel your body at all, then you may have experienced some trauma if, if you can't sense it at all. And I, I would definitely seek help then. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, that is fantastic. And we're gonna be coming back to you in the panel session. So uh, pop your video off, but don't go away. Thanks very okay. much, Rachel. Okay. Bye. Uh, and all that talk of exercise brings us very neatly to the next panelist, um, Christine Bird. So uh, let's see if we can get Christine up on the screen. Um, let me introduce you to Christine. She is a chartered women's health physiotherapist. And what that means is that she specializes in areas such as pelvic pain, pelvic floor, urinary and bowel incontinence. I can really help deal with so many of these debilitating symptoms. She is the founder of the excellent White Heart Clinic in Southwest London. Um, she's also the co-founder of Menopause Movement, which is an online community providing multidisciplinary training to health and fitness professionals looking to support women during the menopause. So if you haven't discovered Menopause Movement, I urge you to check them out. We're in great hands with Christine. So um, welcome. We're dying to hear what you've got to say. Thank so, you, Jackie. Thanks for inviting me. And you, I have to say before I start, you really are a superpower, getting so many women on board. <laughs> So of sharing this so quality information so international as well it's fantastic it Brilliant. is i know we, we are we are a global webinar and i'm thrilled about that so um thank you christine and uh, i should tell everyone that christine it has been my menopause buddy for so many years we have shared platforms almost from the beginning um so i'm thrilled that you're with me today and i know that you've got tons of great information so straight away i want to focus on actually what is the theme of, of this year's world menopause day um, which is bone health. Uh, and I can't think of anyone better to sort of talk to us about why women should be concerned and worried about their bone health. Well, yeah, as a sort of general thing first, as we heard tonight from Sabina and Rachel, menopause is very much a big puzzle. And women into the menopause all need very different parts of that puzzle. But I always think there are three pieces that all women benefit from, which is sleep, good diet and exercise. And I'm a women's health physio, so it's no surprise I've got a bias <laughs> to with <laughs> exercise and movement. Also, I love I love sports. I do believe that exercise is the big non-negotiable in menopause and highly evidenced in terms of how effective it is. It helps as all aspects of your health, mental, gut, cardiovascular, brain health, metabolism. It reduces cancer risk. The list goes on. So muscles are very much women's best friends into, into the menopause. And recently, probably one of the bigger scientific breakthroughs in the, sort of in the last decade is that we understand that muscles and bones are part of your endocrine system. So they're part of your hormone system. So scientists have labeled very, very special molecules in your muscles called hope molecules. They're quite sort of happy <laughs> molecules yeah. and they communicate on a hormonal level and they trigger your reward system, which, which is great news, <laughs> really. And that's probably why people get hooked in a healthy way to exercise, that is if you persevere. You do have to do it for a couple, couple of months. So we, of course, are delighted that this year's focus of World Menopause Day is, is bone health. And we want to raise awareness of the significance of osteoporosis and its absolutely devastating impact on many women. There are solutions, but of course, we also want you to be aware of. So osteoporosis, as most of you probably know, is a condition where the bones become fragile. So increasing the risk of fracture. And osteoporosis means there's a decrease in the amount of bone mass and microscopic alterations to the architecture as well. If you think about bone health, think as a continuum. So while osteoporosis uh, reflects on one end of the scale and is the highest risk of fracture, many more women have low bone mass, which also increases the risk of fracture, but it's not yet osteoporosis. And this used to be called osteopenia, but we don't use that term, term now. So most of you here are over 50, so you are likely to be, to be losing bone while you're listening. 
to this. So okay. bone, yeah, but bone is a reactive tissue, so it's constantly remodeled, meaning it's reabsorbed and new bone is laid down. In fact, our entire skeletal system is completely replaced every 10, 10 years, so they're busy. <laughs> and the key is that you've got your money in the bank early on. You don't want to go into the menopause, ideally, with a sort of a bone density overdraft, because women tend to reach their peak bone mass in their late 20s. In your 30s, the bone mass balance slightly tips in favor of bone loss, and there's a small but steady decline. In your mid-teens, you really build bones most rapidly, so do talk to your daughters <laughs> and your young friends. Saying that the loss of bone mass can be minimized or even reversed with strength and impact exercise, so lots of yeah. people as well. So why- I'm just really encouraged to see that someone's actually lifting weights while they're listening to this. Yay, so yay, congratulations, yeah, Tracy, that. I think that's fabulous. Um, fantastic. Yeah. I, I also want to give a quick shout out to um, a couple of uh, the Happy Menopause podcast specials I recorded for World Menopause Day. One of them was with a woman called Dr. Catherine Walter, who is an academic. She, a non-sporty lady, took up uh, powerlifting at the age of 65. She's become a world record holder and she has the bone density of a 20 year old. So um, I know that you've listened to that because wow, I, I, I listened to it today. Listen. And, really and I think it's a wonderful example of just how you can turn things around, isn't it? Yeah, no, absolutely. She is actually, I really would recommend anyone to listen to that podcast because I think we all need role models like that who are probably slightly older because we don't have many of them. And she, she no. is, she's gold dust. She's brilliant. Yeah. So what I'd like you to all understand, so why is that this sort of decline of bone mass into the menopause? So it's yeah. estrogen, our main reproductive hormone, major player in bone uh, formation. So the time of most rapid bone loss starts approximately one year before your final menstrual period. And it lasts about three years, which is the time that you move from your peri to your postmenopause. And on average, women lose about 6% of bone mass, but it can be as much as 15 to 20 percent so if you consider a woman of 65 she's living independently and breaks her hip and one year later she has a 50 percent chance of being unable to live independently and 40 percent chance of being unable to walk independently that's why this needs so much more attention we want women to be just as likely to get screening for osteoporosis as for a mammogram it's affordable it's called a DEXA scan. So the bottom line very much is that all women over 65 that are not on preventative treatments ideally would be screened. And many women with any other risk factors or fragility fractures need testing as well. But let's move on to the good news because the good news is that exercise, nutrition and medication like HRT is highly effective and there are other good medical options as well. Women do need to do multi-directional high impact and strengthening exercises basically yeah. muscles pull on bone and weight bearing produces stress on bones and that st is, stimulates the bone yeah because i think one of the things i observe particularly with women in my nutrition clinic is that there tends to be a move to the mat as we move into midlife you know we're doing a lot of restorative yoga we're doing a lot of pilates nothing wrong with those they're great in lots of ways but we're suddenly sort of letting go of some of the other areas. Do, do you agree that that's a bit of an issue? Absolutely. Saying that I love lying on the mat and I can't wait <laughs> until we can lie, <laughs> lie like, yes, but it is so true. <laughs> we do need to do resistant and impact exercise. Yeah. yeah. So what are we talking about? What is that? Well, this can be any resistance or impact that makes a muscle pull on a bone. It's that simple. As long as there's enough stimulus, stimulus to make an adaptive change it can be your own body weight uh, it can even be water if you swim if you swim really hard uh, it can be catching a ball especially if it's a heavy medicine ball it can be free weights the key thing to remember hopefully from today is the benefit is the moment that you get out of your comfort zone yeah. when it feels hard so we like to help women to get comfortable with discomfort really mm -hmm. So when you feel sweaty, when you feel, you know, you really are working, working hard, that's where the benefit is. It can be small, progressive steps, big leaps. It all works. And if you collapse to the ground, well done. I promise. <laughs> Call me. I will come and pick you off the... <laughs> Excellent. So that's, that's your, your tip of the day, collapse to the ground. But, I mean, you mentioned getting, getting sweaty and tired and all those things, and, and that can put a lot of women off. I mean... What are the barriers and what are the fears around exercise, do you think, for women in midlife? Yeah, I think a lot of the fears are 
Well, Women in Sport did a beautiful piece of research on this, and a lot of the barriers to women, which kind of breaks my heart, is shame. They're either not fit enough, they're not thin enough, they're not cool enough, they're not young enough, you name it, and fear. Yeah. And of course, a lot of other like pelvic health, like continence issues for which women really need to find support. But the key really is that the culture out there for exercise isn't always helpful for women to, to engage with exercise. And I think it's important to reframe it. It's not just running or going to the gym. There is now walking football, there is walking netball, there is open water swimming, hiking, body pump, Zumba, um, like Rachel was saying, something rhythmic, anything that's enjoyable, puts a smile on your face, I think is so important for um, removing some of those barriers. So how mm. can we help women over that hump of starting to really help them lean muscle mass as, as well as that bone mass and there's three things they need to do for that uh, bone respond better to intermittent loads so jumping is better than walking or ball sports when you change direction yeah um, for instance if you do forward lunges start changing directions like on a clock phase don't always go in the same same way because even being an athlete is not always a guarantee bone can desensitize so like running long distances, if you, that's all you do, there's some evidence that the bone cells desensitize and they may turn off their mechanical. Right. Um, so, so it is the impact, the gravity, and there is the weight, the heavy stuff. Yeah. And variety then, variety is really important. Variety is absolutely, it's massive. But one thing that I think that's really helpful to know, so numbers of reps really matters for training. You can start with eight to 12 reps, and then make sure that you really can't lift the 13th one, otherwise it's too light, it's too easy. And then you slowly go to five reps. And your podcast with the lady I listened to today, she, she does everything in five sets of five reps. And it means that the sixth rep, you move to failure, you almost can't lift up that weight. That is strength training. Wow. And then the good news is, especially if you're a bit reluctant or daunted by this, you only have to do it twice a week. The third time does help, but the effect is minimal. So you don't actually have to do a lot of it mm. to get a yeah. success. And there's plenty of evidence that even in your 90s, you can still have adaptive change. It's right. Too late. So it's never too late. Absolutely not. And that is a great way to finish um, our 10 minutes together. Thank you, Christine. There's loads more I want to chat to you about, but we need to move out to the panel. And there's a question sure. I've got no, all saved up for you anyway. Um, so uh, let's bring back um, Sabina and Rachel, if they can come up onto the uh, video thing. Um, I can see there are a few questions there in the chat, but I also had a few questions that came through via um, the uh, uh, sort of in advance from various people as well. So I'm going to start with um, one which you touched on, Sabina, but um, I think it would be good to just reiterate it because you said so much, there was a lot of content in your section. Um, what, how do you know it's brain fog and not uh, early onset dementia? Yeah, they're very different. You know, I described the symptoms associated with brain fog with early onset, with onset, with, with any type of dementia, really what you're talking about issues, um, confusion, you know, um, becoming lost in a place where you should be familiar with uh, finding yourself repeating the same story or asking the same question over and over again without realizing it. They're very they really are very, very different. And generally speaking, you know, a good rule of thumb is um, um, often the person who has dementia in the early stages isn't aware that they have things going going wrong. They can have, you know, they, they can go in and out and there can be like a metacognition where they know something was amiss. But what we're talking about um, in brain fog is really very different. It's something that everybody feels you know, experiences all of the time, you, you know, whenever there's an ordinary thing happens like jet lag or not having enough sleep or when you're chronic, chronically stressed or you're overwhelmed or you've taken too much on or even just at the end of the day. You know, if you've had a really, really busy day and someone says to you, OK, I need to talk about now. What are we going to do about the mortgage? You go, no, <laughs> can't talk about that now. My brain is just too full. And really, literally, your brain is just too full. You, a part of your brain called the hippocampus, it's a temporary repository for the information that you take in during the day and you need 
to sleep in order for that information to be processed, to be turned into memories, to then be integrated with your previous experiences and memories so that when you wake the next day, your hippocampus is clear enough to take in new information. So you must yeah. always play a sleep, repay a sleep debt, you know, if you have missed sleep. So napping is actually a very good way to get around that, particularly in menopause, or I'd often say to younger women who are woken during the night with babies, you know, napping is, you know, we we have a natural dip in alertness in early afternoon and some people may do better with you know two bouts of sleep one slightly longer and then sort of a nap and and you can nap in many ways you can have a preemptive nap so if you think you're going to be going out with the girls and having a late night or whatever you can take a little nap before you go out so that you counteract similarly you know you know one one you know afterwards to kind of make up but it's really important timing and duration of a nap is very important right. so really you shouldn't be napping after 3 p.m also don't ever nap for longer than 10 to 15 minutes if you are going to be longer than 10 to 15 minutes then make it 90 minutes because if you wake up in between so 10 to 15 minutes you don't go into deep sleep if you go anywhere between 10 to 15 minutes and 90, you go into deep sleep. And therefore, when you wake up, you'll wake up sleep drunk. You will wake feel up feeling worse than you ever did. So it, that's yeah. kind of really critical. And they're, they're, they're very, um, okay. they're very kind of simple, well, practical things. That brings us very neatly to one of the questions that came into the chat, actually, which was all about sleep. Um, someone was just saying, you know, what, what can I do and how can I um, you know, sustain a, a better sleep? Um, so I'm going to put. Uh, go over to Rachel first of all. Have you got any suggestions um, about yeah. sleep or okay. advice? I'm, I'm a napper, so I, I love the little power naps when I can in my working day. In terms of going to bed, try Googling sleep hygiene and sleep routines. You probably know all this. You know how it's better not to look at screens for the hour before you go to bed. I try and wind down for the hour before bed if I've just been exercising or having a really exciting chat with a friend it takes time for my mind and body to slow down. And if you're able to keep the bedroom just for sleeping and sex, or, you know, rather than going on the phone, I, I just try and leave my phone outside the bedroom. I don't always succeed, but otherwise I'm tempted when I wake up in the middle of the night. To, oh, I'll just, I'll just look a quick look. It doesn't yeah. help. Yeah. Breathing, doing that mindful breathing when you wake up in the night and not worrying about it too much. Just going, I'll just, I'll just lie here. Yeah. Think about all the good things that happened today. Mm. And, and can I jump Christine. in kindly on that? Sorry, just to say, I have a whole chapter on sleep. Regularity is key for sleep. Absolutely. Mm. Same you. time you get up. Uh, exposure to natural daylight is critical. There's a part of your brain that actually needs to be exposed. So get out in daylight for an hour a day and expose yourself to light first thing in the morning and turn on the lamps from about eight, you know, turn on off overhead lights. And also your temp your bedroom should be cool. You've got to drop your core body temperature by one degree in order to enter a sleep mode and that's why we struggle so much when we have menopause and and half flush sorry for jumping in but no you know, no no, no. Really, it's the whole point of having really a make those things i mean i i saw someone flashed up there that they had long covid and and um uh brain fog as a consequence and and my book before it was published i got people with um hormonal issues with um autoimmune diseases with migraine and people with long covid to take the 30-day plan and you know one of the individuals who had long covid said it just completely changed her life the first week focuses on sleep and she really hadn't realized the practical little things that she could do and it actually transferred she went from not being able to walk to the door to actually by week three which is the exercise week to be able to do online yoga classes and most well, that of that takes us neatly to christine on the exercise <laughs> Sorry, yeah. front so let's ask christine your tips on the sleep front what would you say I think what um, probably what Rachel and Sabina are saying as well, and obviously with an exercise bias, be outdoors. I think being outside and getting daylight um, promotes so many of your of, of your happy hormones <laughs> in your reward system. And of course, the more positive uh, impact you have on your reward system, you know that's always competing with your cortisol. And we need cortisol, but just not too much for too long yeah. and too too high. And I think what you always say, Jackie, if there's one thing you do, because <laughs> stress doesn't go out of your life, is stabilize your blood sugar levels. Absolutely. And that's yeah. thing you can do to, yeah. do to do so. And exercise absolutely also helps to stabilize your blood sugar levels. 
Yeah, I think um, you know, from a nutritional perspective, there's a lot you can do when you're thinking about sleep. And I would always say to someone who has no trouble getting off to sleep, but who wakes up for no apparent reason in the night, and it's not hot flush or anything obvious, that it, chances are your blood sugars drop. So you need to look at what you're doing um, during the uh, evening. In fact, someone said they're waking up there between two or 3 a.m classic sign really of, of uh, your blood sugar crashing so what are you doing in the evening you know are you having you know a large bowl of pasta white pasta maybe with tomato sauce so no fiber no protein are you having chocolate popcorn alcohol are you going to bed with your blood sugar high so that it crashes and eventually your stress hormones are released and they're going to be waking you up to redress the balance so i would look at that Someone I saw pop magnesium um, in the chat. I'm a huge fan of um, magnesium. And I know Christine and I have laughed in the past that um, when we talk about our favorite things that, to support menopause, I say magnesium, she says exercise. So my magnesium is her exercise. Um, and I think you can do it very simply with something like the, the Epsom salts bath, because that's a nice way, you know, two or three handfuls in the bath, um, uh, the soak for about 20 minutes and the magnesium will absorb through the skin, you know, calm the nervous system, regulate the body's response to stress. And of course, that's going to help with your anxiety. It's certainly going to help calm you down and relax your muscles so you're better set to sleep. Um, and then you must remove the obvious triggers, the caffeine and the alcohol. You know, you don't need me to tell you that. Um, so a couple of other questions that have been coming up. Um, advice on uh, mood swings. Anything you'd say there, Rachel? First, I must say, perhaps your anger is justified, because as women, we often spend the first decades of our life putting up with things. You know, they annoy us, but we shrug them off. We put other people first. The oxytocin hormone makes us just put other people first. That's useful if we are bringing up young children. When the estrogen goes down, we have less tolerance. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing if we start putting ourselves first and showing people when we're fed up. So I, I guess that's not what you want to hear, but I just have to say that, that usually the thing you're annoyed about, there is a reason in there, um, even if you feel your reaction is bigger than it would have been 10 years earlier when you would have shrugged it off. So, so maybe it's worth listening to what's annoying you. Can you do anything about it? Can that other person change? Otherwise, I'm afraid it is the old thing of counting to 10 and breathing. Um, or get a punch bag just to tie in with the exercise, you know, let out that that anger is physical energy. And if you don't let it out physically, and clearly you don't want to damage people or property if you can help it, uh, smash, smash the legs against the wall, go to your local charity shop, buy some china, um, throw it, it's really cathartic, play golf, if you enter golf, I'm not, you know, do something, pound the streets by running, let it out, have a good yell if you've got a, a quiet room or an empty field. Seriously, you need to let that rage out in a safe way. So that would be my top tips. Yeah. Um, any thoughts um, on rage and anger and exercise, Christine? Yeah, and I, I totally agree with Rachel. I think women are great putter uppers and I often have these conversations with my patients as well. And there's no hero states at the end of it, no statues will be built for you, no medals to be won. <laughs> <laughs> so it's about time that um it's great that we stop putting up with things yeah. <laughs> really and start start changing that but again of course exercise and especially again resistance training and also somebody just popped in the chat as well i've got osteoporosis one study i'd really like you to have a look at, at is the lift more study mor at the end it's an australian study and it was done um on 100 menopausal women and they all had low bone density osteoporosis and they with weight training and supervised weight training in a sensible way and they did, did let that lift and squats they all improved their bone density mm -hmm. so really with the right support and maybe you need a, a pt or your gp or a women's health physio someone to support you and guide you into it but with osteoporosis it's a little bit different if you've had spinal fractures uh, but if you haven't had any fragility fractures yet weight training and loading is absolutely the way forward and it yeah. works, it's safe. It is safe. It's not safe not to load, it's mm -hmm. safe to load. And that's, it's very fearful if you have osteoporosis to load, but it's actually safer to load than not to load. Yeah, oh, that's very um, useful. Yeah. Sorry, were you gonna say something, Rachel? I can just see the comments in the chat that when we as women get more rageful and put up with things less, it's hard for those around us. Yes, it is. 
They've just got to adapt. We've adapted around them for decades. Sorry, I don't think you can make it that much easier for them. Um, but it is hard and it would help if they knew, like we all put up with teenagers, don't we? We know they're going through puberty and they can be a bit irrational, a little bit angry. And we just don't take it too personally. So I think people living with us need to go, hey, maybe she has a point. Oh, that was a bit loud, but hey, it's not personal. It's just how you're feeling. Now, I realize that will be like a foreign language to those of you who are used to mitigating your behavior and being small and being nice and all the things you were told as little girls. No more Mrs. Nice Guy. Okay, yes, it's tough for them to adjust. It's not hard, half as hard for them as it is for us. We're all in this together. They Amazing. Sabina, your thoughts on rage? Um, well, I think irritability is really also can be a consequence of brain fog and insufficient sleep and poorly managed chronic stress and all, uh, you know, inappropriate diet, uh, lack of exercise, lack of stimulation, lack of joy in your life, you know, lack of doing something True. for you. Yeah. So I think the thing is really, you know, make an appointment with yourself, sit down and write down all those things that are really annoying. Basically, actually, what I suggest is make a list of all the things you are, you know, all the roles you play, mother, friend, sister, daughter, carer, whatever, employee, and make a list of all the things that you do, because most of us are overwhelmed. And if you're overwhelmed, you're going to be irritable. And actually, sometimes you will take that rage out on the wrong person. I think that's really important. And you want to nurture the relationships that are important to you. And unfortunately, you can impact your rage on actually the very person who's trying to support you, because that will have the, net, the, the least impact immediately, because they'll forgive you. So when you do that little exercise of listing all those things, and you mustn't let anyone else see this, because you've got to do it really honestly because it includes things like being a mother you know bringing my kids to school whatever and then you put down opposite each of those items why you do the thing and how much you love it and you will very very soon find out that there are a number of activities that you do for the wrong reasons because you feel you should have because you think it, you know it's something you always did because of guilt or whatever and there's a lot of things that you do that you simply don't enjoy or that you no longer joy enjoy and really what you're left with then is this core group of things that you love doing for the right reasons that give you pleasure and give you joy and then you need to start culling those other activities just start getting rid of them often you'll find the things that it's friends or family members are always making you irritable you know start to step away of course there's some things that you do because you have to like a job that you mightn't enjoy etc but again it's about kind of um prioritizing you know and eliminating a lot of the stuff by the time you get to our age we've gathered a lot of crap you know and we do a lot of things on autopilot on habit because we don't think about it or because we always did it's something i did um in about 2017 and it just completely changed my life i kind of was looking at so much stuff and going why am I doing that? And I discovered actually a lot of what I was doing was progressing my professor's career, not mine. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's a lot of people um, and I, you know, I have two sons, a son in law and a husband. I have no daughters. I'm very, you know, I really like men. I'm not very anti men. But unfortunately, there are some men in positions of power who see that in us and who manipulate that in us and who see I've had it said to me once oh the job of a great leader is to find people who have great ideas that they can use to blah 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 or whatever but basically they were talking about yeah well I'm going to use you every way I can to achieve Hi. my goals you know but anyway yeah I think that's a great exercise make an because we don't give enough time to ourselves make an appointment with yourself and sit yeah. down and spend an hour doing that exercise one of the best things I've ever done <laughs> yeah I think that's really great advice I've, i'm going to pick on one last question that i saw that popped up a minute ago just need to scroll back because there have been a lot of comments can i just say audience i think you're awesome you're so engaged and you're coming up with some fantastic comments and interacting with each other as well so thank you very much for being such an active part of this now we've got a great question here a comment from nicola who says you mentioned earlier about talking to your gp about your mental fog how is it that the GP can help? Mine isn't very informed, so I have to know what I'm asking for. Now, Rachel, I'm going to start with you. What would you say there? Yeah, um, I don't know, so it might be best to ask somebody else because I would just read the NICE guidelines and take that to them. But 
So I'll pass to the other two. Any thoughts from you, Sabina? Yeah, absolutely. I think it would be very good to keep a diary to have, you know, data that you are bringing to your doctor. And I think it's very important to let them know the impact that it is having on your life. Most of us go and say, oh, gosh, you know, I'm kind of a bit foggy in my thinking. And they'll say, oh, it's probably the menopause. Or they'll say, oh, are you overwhelmed? Have you a lot going on in your life? That's what it is. But then they don't give you solutions and a lot of them won't and a lot of them aren't clued in and a lot of them um really do gaslight you you go home thinking that you're mad and again that's one of the reasons I wrote that book the, and I you know I'm I don't mean to keep kind of pushing it but it, it actually does have to sure it it <laughs> to help you figure out the e exact things what you can do is if you suspect it may be some of the underlying medical conditions and migraine is another one that I didn't mention. Um, if you think it's one of an hormonal imbalance, thyroid, you know, issues, your brain communicates using um, electrical and chemical signals. It uses neurotransmitters and it uses hormones. And the thing is with, with, um, with estrogen, um, we tend to think of that as um, our reproductive hormone, but you have estrogen receptors in your hippocampus, which is the part of your brain involved in learning and memory. You have estrogen receptors all over your body and your brain. So if there's a fluctuation and an imbalance in that, it's going to impact on your cognitive functioning. And I think it can be about educating your GP and about actually saying to him, no, this is impacting on my life. I appreciate it's this, but could it possibly X, Y, Z, you know, I'm on medication, you know, could it be, you know, maybe I'm experiencing experience and symptoms is there any chance it could be an underlying condition because you really do want to rule those out um, and ask for for advice where where you can unfortunately I think um you know women it takes longer for women to you know longer time for women to diagnosis than it does for men you know uh, and and we I think we have a role to play in helping to change that. We often accept what's said to us and, and we go home with it. I certainly did it before I had my diagnosis of my autoimmune disease. I was pretty classic about seven years, 10 years nearly before I got my diagnosis. I thought I was going insane. Um, and I think you, we need to start saying to doctors that if we do go home and feel, no, we weren't heard, we weren't listened to, to actually make another appointment or to find another Fine. GP who will that hear you. Excellent advice. So I think we're going to call it a day for the panel now because you've been amazing, but uh, we just need to wrap up for the last few minutes. And there are just a few things I want to say. So first of all, I want to say a huge thank you to the panel. And I want to ask each of you for your single um, short best tip on the subject of the night for each of you. So um, Sabina, your first tip. Your best okay. Time. Yeah, my favorite tip is to smile um, and to laugh. Laughter is nature's natural stress buster. It actually lowers your cortisol levels and we forget often to have fun. And I would suggest that you allow at least an hour every day to do something that makes you laugh, that where you can lose yourself in, where you can have joy. And it will have an incredible impact, not only on your quality of life, but on your health, because smiling and laughter, smiling lowers your blood pressure, it boosts your immune function, it helps helps to um, produce new brain cells and connections. It releases serotonin, honest to goodness. And you don't even have to really feel like it's not reactive. You know, just make that shape. Smile first thing in the morning, last thing at night and share at least one smile with someone else because it's contagious. And so you, you spread those health benefits. Excellent. Uh, Rachel, your tip? Talk about menopause. That's how you'll get informed. That's how you'll know you're not alone. That's how you'll get empowered don't feel ashamed about what you're going through so just talk about it everywhere on the bus in the street with your neighbors with your family and friends brilliant christine at a menopause cafe sorry <laughs> absolutely <laughs> and go to flash fest but i'm coming on to that um christine uh, probably the same as rachel's saying share all this with your friends your family like let's be sisters together and like sabina is saying Find from, you know, actually where I'm standing, from, um, where I'm coming from, find some exercise that does put a smile on your face, some, yeah. something that makes you happy. And please don't be scared to load. You don't want to become fragile. Aging is inevitable, yeah. fragility is not. We can yeah. all be and stay strong women, even if there are health conditions and do go and ask for help if you're fearful for loading and exercise because the benefits are okay. too 
Brilliant. And I'm going to add my nutrition tip for you all, and I'm going to make it very much to the theme of the night. So I'm going to say that you all need to be eating much more protein than you probably are. You need to be eating protein with every meal and every snack. And what am I talking about? I'm saying the classic meat, fish, eggs, or the plant protein, soya, um, lentils, chickpeas, beans, quinoa, nuts, seeds, hummus. Don't mind what it is, but I want protein with every meal and snack. And it's going to tick the boxes. Definitely going to tick the boxes for your bone and muscle health because they're both made of protein. We need them. Um, we need protein because it balances our blood sugar. And if we keep our blood sugar nice and stable, then the brain is going to have a steady supply of glucose because the brain is entirely reliant on glucose um, for its, its energy. And if you have lots of spikes and then crashes, you're going to be you know, wired and then completely shot to pieces. And that's not going to help if brain fog and poor concentration are an issue for you. We need protein because the amino acids found in proteins um, are used by the body to create neurotransmitters that govern things like mood, memory and motivation. Um, so really start to think about that. And if I still haven't convinced you, for goodness sake, our skin, our hair and our nails are made of protein. If you haven't got enough protein, um, then your body will prioritize your vital organs like your heart and your liver. So your hair is going to look rubbish. There we are. That's my final word on protein. <laughs> Um, so I want to say um, a huge thank you to the panel and I want to announce our winners now. So can we just um, pop up the prize draw slide and I'm going to scroll back um, to, I know I've been given the names and I've just been so much in the chat since then, I've lost the winners. Uh, hold on, going back a little bit, uh, bear with me. Oh, I've lost the chat now. Uh, sorry. The screen came up and I lost the chat. Uh, so, right, just going back. Tell you who oh, would you announce them, Laura? That'd be fab. That'd be much more efficient than me trying to scroll. Sorry, guys. Let me just go back to my notes. So, um, I had um, for uh, the Empanil. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Emapel. Emapel, which is the gorgeous, luxurious skincare product. We have Karen Day. Karen, congratulations. Those of you who didn't win know that um, Emma Pell sponsors the Happy Menopause podcast and you can get 20% off if you listen to the podcast and pick up the discount code. So congratulations, Karen. And then for uh, Better You, we had Nicola Merchant. Yay, congratulations, Nicola. Tons of vitamin D and magnesium. Great news. Then for Silk, we had uh, Alika Adair. Oh, that's fantastic. Now, I want to give Silk a big shout out because there was talk of vaginal dryness in the chat. They do a fabulous parabens-free, entirely natural uh, lubricant. And if you weren't the winner, which obviously most of you weren't, if you sign up to their website, um, you can get a free sample. So I would definitely urge you to do that. Then... Um, Sabina's prize, which is very generous. Thank you so much, Sabina, for donating that. We had uh, Angel Ortiz. Sorry, I didn't catch the name. Angel Ortiz. Oh, excellent. Angel, if you're still here. And then for a free copy of uh, two of Jackie's books, I'm just finding the name because we pulled it last minute. Um, sorry, now I have to go through the, the, the chat. You guys have all... Mean, meanwhile, I'll put up my two books. Um, yeah. And here are mine. And I'll be sending an audio version. So if they want, if, if the winner wants to email me at info at superbrain.ie, because that's how I'll have to send the book is... is, is That's fine. We'll make sure we can make it, Sabina. Yeah. Don't worry. And we'll be in touch with all the winners via email in any case to get your addresses for the hard copies of everything that you've won. Um, I'm also going to be tucking in a copy of the Happy Menopause uh, in all the packs so that you can enjoy it. Um, so I, I think the last thing I'd like to do is, um, can you pop up the final slide for me, please, uh, um, Laura? Sure, Jackie. This is an important slide because here we are. I just want you all to know where you can find, not just me, but really uh, our fabulous panelists, because haven't they been amazing? So Dr. Sabrina Brennan, uh, you can find her via her website, which I've popped up there. You can follow her on social media at Sabrina Brennan and do listen to her Superbrain podcast. 
If you want a little bit of a snippet of that, um, I recorded with her for the Happy Menopause back in May, but she does a fabulous weekly podcast called Super Brain, which you should definitely check out. Um, huge thank you to Rachel um, for her real wonderful words of wisdom there around um, anxiety and just listening to your voice makes me feel calmer, I have to say. Um, so look out for Rachel, both at the Rowan Consultancy, but also um, the Menopause Cafe. <laughs> Um, oh, and um, the hashtag there is hashtag uh, FlushFest2022. So start to look out for that. But if you sign up to Menopause Cafe newsletter, you'll be they'll be in touch when it's time to get your um, tickets. And it's a fabulous festival. It's not just lots of health and well-being talks, although there are tons of those. But we have you know things like midlife cabaret. There's um, usually stand up. Uh, comedy there's all manner of marvelous things last year's was just fabulous so I'm sure next year's will be brilliant and then a, a wonderful again a big shout out to Christine um, for her words of wisdom around uh, exercise always so in, in enthusiastic and motivating um, there's the White Heart Clinic link and also the menopause movement link and any of you out there who are fitness professionals I would urge you to go and take a look at the menopause movement because fabulous online courses are really going to be um, incredibly helpful to you supporting your clientele um, if you're working with women in midlife. So um, that's it um, over and out uh, from all of us. Um, really hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we're going to lurk around and just see what comes through on the chat for the next few minutes. But uh, thanks for bearing with us with our technical difficulties, but I'm sure you'll agree it was absolutely worth the wait. So bye everybody and um, hope to see you all on social media.